Welcome in everyone today to a very special episode of American Joyride. We are joined today by Alan Mack, a former pilot from the 160th SOAR unit of the United States Army. He is also the author of Razor 3, which you can see right over his shoulder, his book. Thank you very much for being here today, Alan. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So right away, I want to jump right into kind of the chaos and, and stuff that you did while serving. Let's start with September 11th. So where right. were you on September 11th, and how do you remember the events of that day kind of unfolding? Well, September 11th, I was at uh, Camp Beauregard, Louisiana. It's a National Guard base uh, in support of the Joint Readiness Training Center, JRTC. And we were doing maritime ops with our helicopters and Zodiacs from the 5th Special Forces Group um, the night before into September 11th, like, like 2 in the morning. And then a couple hours later, I got woke up from somebody in the hallway. It's one of those, you know, those old uh, cinder block buildings with tile floors. Uh, so every noise echoes like crazy. And I heard a lot of commotion. So I opened my door. And, you know, what's going on? Oh, you got to turn your TV on. And nobody, nobody even had any words for it. So I turned on the TV and saw one of the towers was burning and they were talking about a an airplane that had run into it. And I was thinking, you know, as a pilot, I'm thinking, Oh, that guy's in trouble. You know I mean? Well, he didn't live, but uh, you know, somebody's in trouble thinking it was a, uh, you know, general aviation uh, because that had happened before in the thirties, I think to the empire state building. So I thought, wow, that's kind of screwed up. And then while I'm watching it, you know, another plane hits. I was like, Oh, this is not an accident. This is intentional now. And so I kind of started waking everybody up that wasn't already awake. And, uh, just waiting to see what happened, you know, and, and the horrible scenes of, you know, people jumping out of the building um, and, and, the, and then obviously the building's coming down, you know, just really is gut wrenching. And uh, from there, we, the entire um, air system, you know, airplanes, helicopters, whatever, were all shut down. So you couldn't fly anywhere other than, you know, defensive fighter jets and uh, so we rented a car and drove back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky from, uh, from Louisiana. And how long after 9-11 does your unit, the 160th SOAR, which is the most elite helicopter pilots in the world, how long does it take for you guys to figure out, okay, a plan's being set in motion, we're going to Afghanistan. Was it within days? Was it within weeks? When it, was within, it was within hours. Within hours. Uh, so we drive back that night, the battalion commander and I, and the next morning, I'm sent down in a 15-passenger van with a bunch of other planners to Tampa, Florida. And we're to plan the, America's response, you know, as far as the rotary wing side of it. And uh, by October 3rd, I was in the country of Uzbekistan preparing to do personnel recovery uh, for the bombing campaign that was about to kick off. And this is depicted in the movie 12 Strong, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, where yep. you guys are going to fly in from Uzbekistan. This is what's known as the horse soldiers. This is going to kind of be the first wave. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So initially we're there for, I want to say about two weeks of bombing. And then there is no further plan that we know of. And then all of a sudden, 5th Special Forces Group rolls in. Their commander takes over the task force. We're in task force dagger out of K2 Air Base, Karshi Kanabad, and he wants a briefing on our capabilities. And uh, so we sat down and we started talking to him about, you know, the mountains and the distances that we can or can't fly, the way the weather is and all these things. And he's like, gee, you know, I wish somebody had told us that ahead of time, you know, and ironically, when I was in Tampa, they were one room over and nobody ever connected us, you know, because it just wasn't considered important, but now it was, especially as they heard that, you know, the mountains were, you know, 20,000 feet and that the weather was horrible and all these things. And um, so we, we tell him what we can do. And he goes, well, you guys are going to start doing a, a UW campaign, which is unconventional warfare. That's where you link up individual operational detachments or ODAs up with factions of the Northern Alliance, which were the allies that we were trying to uh, coordinate with. So, 
it went from there. <laughs> so, and, and, and I'm glad you brought up the 20,000 feet thing. Cause I, I had in my notes, I wanted to ask you in the movie, it's depicted that helicopters had never flown that high and they weren't sure whether or not it could be done. Was, was that how it actually worked in real life that you guys didn't know if the altitude was even workable? Uh, yes and no, but not for the reasons that you might think. So helicopters had flown that high. Chinook helicopters routinely fly at 25,000 feet in Alaska, right, over the, over the mountains there. They do the rescue mission at the top of that. It uh, was at Mount McKinley, I think. And um, so it is possible. But using a um, – uh carrying a usable load going the distance that we need to go as far as you know because we had to trade off fuel for cargo if you will people right. and so the the math didn't work out you know and we're wearing supplemental oxygen you know, or how long is that going to last you know per console for the people you got on board so there's a lot of calculations that have to go into this that you know really weren't operationally um proven you know, I mean, we, I operated in Colorado all the time, but that's nothing compared to Afghanistan. So walk, so that's a perfect, that's perfect. So you're, you're now in unfounded territory. When you get on the, I don't know if you call it a joystick or whatever, but when that helicopter leaves Uzbekistan for the first time, and it's now onward to Afghanistan, we're going to start dishing out some, some revenge, some payback for 9-11. What's going through your mind as you feel that thing lift up and you know, you're now part of history. Uh, uh, you know, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it, the way you, you teed it up. You know, it, the very first night that I went out on the mission with the 595 guys, the horse soldiers, uh, all of our aircraft were parked up against hardened aircraft shelters, and they would tug them out to the runway uh, with a little tractor, and then we'd get in and, and go from there. And as I walked along with, with my aircraft, as it was being towed, it was very slow. You know, it, it kind of reminded me of Apollo 13 when Tom Hanks is walking along the, with a Saturn V is just being put on the launch pad and everybody's looking at you, you know, all the support people, the air force and uh, anybody that's, that's behind the scenes. They're just, they're out there to watch you go and everybody's quiet and it's dead quiet. You can just hear the bearings squeaking in the wheels and it was very muddy, you know, it's like, I, I can't even describe the mud. If anybody's ever been to Germany, the Grafenbeer, it's kind of like that. It's sort of a real sticky, thick mud on the taxiway. And you could hear the, you know, the tires just kind of turning up the mud. And when I got to the aircraft, you know, the, the colonel comes out and the chaplain and all these people, because we didn't expect really to make it home. And uh, I wouldn't call it a, I me. Mean, I played back on here guess we're not gonna get it uh, i have a motion sensor on my light and uh, oh so not a word anyway can you see me okay yeah i can see you great you look fine yeah, okay all right so anyway um walking out with the helicopter it's it's very surreal you know and i look up and the sky is like this dark black with the stars just popping and i saw uh the constellation orion which it was just odd that it's so easy to pick out and I thought, wow, that's really cool, you know. And and then throughout the years, I would look for Orion before missions, and I always used to think if, if I could see Orion, you know, life was going to be good, you know. And that never did prove to be wrong, but uh, not sure that's true. But uh, you get out to the aircraft, and like I said, everybody comes to visit, you know, shake your hand because they don't expect to see you again. And then the team rolls in, you know, we talk real fast, jump in the aircraft, and in the spool up of a of a Chinook is really cool. You know, these big engines and uh, when the rotors start spooling up, you know, you, the aircraft starts to shake and then it, it just kind of vibrates. And then uh, we left on time. Uh, the aircraft weighed what it was supposed to. And uh, I, I can't even describe the, uh, the adrenaline and the, uh, the exhilaration really of, of taking off. I can't even imagine. I just did picturing it in my mind, knowing that we're now about to be the tip of the spear of the guys that are going in and they're going to unleash what's coming. Did you face resistance coming in? Like did the Taliban and Al Qaeda, did they have the means to engage the Chinooks that were coming or were they completely caught off guard? Uh, they, they did have the means to resist, but they were caught off guard because uh, first thing we had to get out of Uzbekistan 
and there was some turmoil politically between the military and the civilian government as to whether or not they were going to support us. And the base commander where we were at K2 uh, was a former Soviet officer. Now he's a colonel in the Uzbek Air Force. And he told us that the air defense network in Uzbekistan, so this is the friendly country, has vowed to shoot us down if they see us because they don't agree with the political nature of letting us in there. So now we're running radar jammers to get out of Uzbekistan <laughs> and we cross the border. We get our air refueling in Uzbekistan. We cross the border, run immediately into a sandstorm. So the sandstorm is good and bad. It's good because it hides us from the enemy. So even though they could hear us, they couldn't see us. And it was bad because my uh, wingmen, the uh, DAPs, MH-60 DAPs, or the armed Blackhawks, uh, didn't have the same equipment that I had to get through the storm. So I had to go by myself or, you know, me and my crew. So, so when you, so what you're saying is when you get through in those, uh, and they're called direct action penetrators, correct? Yes. Yeah. They peel off, they go back. Now it's just you and the ships. How many guys you got with you? Uh, so there's two pilots, the battalion commander sitting in what we call the jump seat, which is like in between me and the other pilot and slightly behind us. And then uh, four crew chiefs, a flight and engineer, and three crew chiefs. And then how many guys from the from the horse soldiers are you hauling into Afghanistan? All 12. So originally we had planned on dividing the team up in two. So there's some redundancy for, first of all, if somebody gets shot down or crashes. And uh, it makes it light enough. We had enough gas to do the mission. With the, But there was another mission that, that took precedence, actually, that was uh, west of us. ODA 555 or triple nickel had to get to uh, a, a warlord named Fahim Khan. He vowed that if he didn't get his U S forces first, he would attack general Dostum. So Dostum couldn't get his forces first. Dostum didn't care. So originally the 555 guys were supposed to go in the night before and they got turned around two nights in a row for bad weather. And so secretary Rumsfeld actually called the planning area himself poor major picks up the phone while we're all asleep and he's like, you know, Hello. <laughs> this is the talk at uh, K2, you know, TF dagger. And he's like, this is Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, who am I speaking to? He's like, ah, oh, you know, this is major, you know, whatever his name was. And uh, he goes, you tell Mulholland, who's our commander is you get those teams in tonight, period. And it hangs up. Okay. New, new, uh, new guidelines so they took one of my aircraft and joined it with the other two for the other mission because they were going higher altitudes they were going to go to about twenty two thousand, and on this particular mission i was supposed to go to about 12 so i had the performance to take all 12 people but i would have to do air refueling both in and out as opposed to having enough gas so that was a challenge that's something we never like to do is leave it to just air refueling because it some nights it's a lot of fun and other nights <laughs> it's scary as hell. When you dropped, when you get into Afghanistan and the horse soldiers get dropped off where they're meant to be and you take off and now you're refueling on your way back, how many return trips or did you not make any in that immediate window when now the ground forces are coming? How often were you in and out from Uzbekistan? Uh, we were flying every night. So initially we thought it would be every three to five nights. And it turned into every night we'd fly. So we had two teams, two teams of two. And sometimes we'd mix them up. Like in this case, you know, you might take a team of three and then the other guy might sit and plan for the next night. And, uh, or we'd all fly together. It could be all four of us, but every night. So, you know, in the movie 12 strong, there's the one team, you know, five, nine, five. And that wasn't true. We put about 20, 21 teams in over the course of, you know, a couple of weeks. And are you getting updates back in Uzbekistan, like daily updates of like, hey, they're in contact with the enemy. They've, they've linked up with General Dostum, I think was his name. Like, yep. Do you have a good idea of the progress that you're helping the guys make once they're on the ground? Or we in do. your mind is, it, okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, to include, you know, not only are they there, but they have to be resupplied. Right. So we did have C-130s that could do airdrops. Uh, but for the most part, it's easier for the Chinooks to bring stuff in. You know, I brought in, uh, a gator uh, for uh, 595. And we joked that General Dostum drove into Kabul, you know, on a gator while everybody else was on horseback. You know, I don't know if they really did, but that was just a, you know, good advertisement well, for John Deere. Yeah, I say, we'll let the legend <laughs> live. It makes for a good story. 
I want to pivot a little bit to Tora Bora and the hunt that went down in Bin Laden for Bin yeah. Laden, where it came so close. I've actually had the honor to interview some guys involved in Tora Bora. But what was your role or the role of the 160th SOAR when it came to whatever was going down? Because it's, well, first off, let's back up. It's a mountainous region, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a yep. cave system. And yep. Pakistan's on the other side of that cave system where he ultimately escapes to. But right. from an aerial aspect, what was 160th SOAR's role and what went down in Tora Bora? So initially, our role was just to transport people in, right? So... They were all at a at a headquarters. Uh, Tom Greer writes in his book about this this headquarters where they were. Uh, I can't think of the guy's name off the top of my head, but um, we would bring follow on forces in because they you know the more they explored, the more people they needed right to cover ground. Uh, the different cave complexes were all over the place. It's very elaborate, and so we started with that you know bringing in people and then supplies. And then as they identified cave complexes on imagery, uh, we would get tasked with taking teams like cave exploration teams to those caves. So they would drop bombs on them and then, or in them, and then we would go exploit them. We'd go, you know, investigate, you know, was there anything inside? Were there people? Was it Bin Laden? We actually did one thing that was kind of neat. There was a, a robot. You know, like a little track robot that actually had been on the pile at ground zero. And then when we were done there, they brought it over to Afghanistan and we would lower it down from the back of a Chinook. So we'd come to a, you know, a, a hover, a high hover, because we expected there to be mines everywhere. And uh, we would lower this thing down. It was big. It was like, um, I don't know, size of a Pelican case, you know, about yay big, like a small microwave, I guess. And we would lower that down with a 550 cord from about 150 feet and it would go on the ground and we had to keep the tail of the aircraft uh, facing the cave and the robot operator had a little console, it was a remote control, and he would drive into the, the cave and explore and then the 550 cord would drag with him. So if, if he lost signal, at least the, the rope would essentially be outside the cave and then we would, you know, we could land and drag the damn thing back into the the helicopter that was pretty neat out of when you're in Tora Bora and you're, you're doing this cave you're dropping guys in they're searching caves how often are they coming into contact with people is it every day because the reason I asked that is my understanding is you know there a guy I interviewed said that the bombing campaign at Tora Bora was unlike anything he'd ever seen before that they were calling in airstrikes just constantly <sighs> so were you getting yeah. like were you visually seeing the Taliban and Al-Qaeda or as a pilot, did you not really see anything because all the action was in the cave? Yeah, the action was not just in the caves, but they were kind of up up valleys and around corners, you know. So these these valleys aren't wide open straight things; they're curvy, uh, snake snake like shapes, you know. So we would try to stay away from that, so we'd get shot down, and it was easier for them to drive in and drive out, or walk in, walk out. And the problems they had were mortars. And RPGs, you know, they'd drive up, you know, as far as they could go. So then they would walk in, but then they'd come under attack and have to withdraw and then try it another day, or, or we'd bomb that position and then try it again. You know, so the, you know, what you heard about it, the bombing campaign being unprecedented is true. I mean, the mountains glowed, you know, I remember I'm flying at night using night right. vision goggles. So the only example I could give for anybody that's had any experience with night vision goggles is when you fly out west when the wildfires are happening and you see the mountains just glow well, that's what they look like in Tora Bora. i actually have a question about night vision that we're <clears> going to get to here in a little bit because i did notice on your website and in the book that it talks about how you're very experienced with the night vision flying which is pretty cool mm -hmm. last thing on the Tora Bora thing do you remember where you were when they told you that bin laden had gotten away and if you yeah. do remember that what were your feelings in that moment well, it, around Christmas time, they did a ceasefire because he was injured, right? They, they knew that. And then he came off the air. And the uh, assumption by CENTCOM, so that's the big command in charge of Central uh, Command Area, or CENTCOM, is um, that he's dead. So they do a ceasefire and they have us stand down. So I'm in Bagram Air Base. And at the time, that's, you know, four Chinooks some 
group guys and some Delta guys is all that are at Pogram. And I remember being pissed off. It's like, there's no way they got them, you know, cause we're getting all the Intel from the, the, the different fusion units there. And it's like, there, there's no way that they got him. We got to keep, we got to keep this up. And uh, they stood down and then uh, I picked up the Delta team that uh, had the near miss with him. You know, they had, they had a little Mexican standoff in the mountains with the, the, the Afghans that brought them in. They had them like within rifle range and uh, they got away and they came back. They were pissed. I've never seen the, the assault force that mad. And uh, so we didn't know. So then the plan was to just go into Pakistan and get him, which we didn't do until much later. Well, okay. I know. Allow me to ask one more question based yeah. off what you just yeah. said. Why do you think that the situation played out that way? Because that's fascinating to me with Tora Bora. Why, even if they thought maybe he was dead, would they not have kept the foot on the gas at the highest level of command mm -hmm. and be like, hey, we got our foot on his throat. Let's keep squeezing. Let's not pull back. What was the logic in thinking, let's call a ceasefire? I think, and this is purely opinion, but watching CENTCOM, the CENTCOM staff operate from, from our area. You know, for example, you know, uh, we either knew there was a threat going into Afghanistan, say a triple A piece or uh, air defense weapon. And I knew that I would have to fly by it. So I would request that it be destroyed. And CENTCOM would say, no, avoid it. Well, I can't avoid it. You know, this is, I mean, that's the one thing. Afghanistan was such a new theater to everybody that, you know, if you look at a map, it, it just, you can't comprehend the differences in altitude and, 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 the, and the size of the country. So when people, you know, use their experiences of, you know, Kuwait, Iraq, you know, uh, Kosovo, you know, they think, well, just avoid it. Well, it's like, no, I can't avoid yeah. it. Right. And so I need it. And then, there was actually a mission other than this where I was supposed to bring an ODA into the top of a mountain. It was surrounded by BM-21s. Now, BM-21s are these multiple launch rocket things. They're from the 50s, but they are very deadly. And they're depicted in the movie 12 Strong. And they're very, very deadly. And they're rocketing the, the LZ on top of this mountain. And I'm supposed to go in. And the colonel calls me in and says, Al, uh, here's what's happening. They won't let us destroy the BM-21s can you get in there? And I said, sir, I can, I can pretty much guarantee I'll get in there. But if those artillery are there, we're not getting out. I mean, as soon as I'm on the ground, they're going to destroy us. And he said, that's what I figured. So he called back CENTCOM and said, Hey, if you don't destroy those artillery pieces, we're not launching. And they said, Nope. Only if an aircraft is being shot at, like actively being shot at. Right. And uh, he said, fine, we're aborting. Right. So we, we did not go. And within hours, Donald Rumsfeld was calling again, saying, why didn't they go in? And when the colonel told him, they changed the rules of engagement, that anything that affected a helicopter flight route in planning could now be struck. So the, the learning process here is one of those things that I, you know, I can't fault some of these decisions. You know, I did at the time. I was like, well, what the hell are they thinking? You know, but, you know, in hindsight, a cooler head and, and, and you know, watching things from you know the future it's like eh, i can see why they might think this or that you know there were times when the taliban fell that uh we had helicopters flying along what we considered friendly positions and they get shot at because they weren't friendly positions technically they were but they people weren't and we would complain to uh like fahim khan hey, your guys are shooting at us tell them to stop and he's like no if they're shooting at you kill them he says, then they're not good. And I mean, he understood the dynamics, but we didn't. You we were trying to be very chivalrous, you know, and right. the, uh, as a matter of fact, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into, you know, Tarka Gar where I got shot down. And, and some of that was, I couldn't shoot until being shot at, unfortunately being shot at from close range. You know, it sounds like a great idea. Look how chivalrous I am. I can, I can, you can shoot at me first before I fight you. And no, if they kill you or disable you, then it's you're done a, but anyway that's done. that's a long way around to talking about Tora Bora. they kind of felt like you know why are we dropping bombs if we don't have to you know if he's dead you know stop dropping bombs uh, yeah okay well yeah I, yeah it does, no it, and, and i gotta tell you you know uh, uh when we opened the u.s embassy in kabul 
uh, General Franks, who was the CENTCOM commander, uh, his guys called and said, hey, we want you to fly him in daylight. And I said, I don't recommend it. I said, every night I go out, I get shot at. And I don't mean like a little bit. I mean like 23 millimeter RPGs, man pads. And they said, no, no, no. Afghanistan is ours now. The Taliban fell. And that is just a little bit of, um, I can't think of the word, but they they just thought it was something that it wasn't, you know, and uh, they thought this situation, they wished away the threat. And so when I flew General Franks in, in the daylight, I had two surface air missiles fired at us and I got him in safe and I had one fired on the way out. And when I reported it, they said, oh, well, maybe he should drive out. I said, yeah, or just wait till nighttime. And they said, but we didn't think there'd be any threat. I said, I told you there'd be threat. You know, right. we every yeah. single yeah. night we get shot at. You know? Well, well, let's talk about you getting shot down. That's actually a perfect segue. So, okay. how how far into your career does the incident occur? Like, how seasoned are you at what you're doing when yeah. when the shoot down happens? Well, let's see. I got to be uh, over twenty years of service. Uh, I've been in the one sixtieth at that point. Let's see, eight eight or nine years, and I'm a flight lead, which is the senior position for any warrant officer in the 160th, uh, very few of us. So to get there, you have to be, you know, number one, you have to have the requisite talent to fly the aircraft. You have to be able to plan. You have to be able to brief. You have to be able to stay calm under pressure and execute. So me and we'll call say my peers, you know, are probably the top of the pyramid in the 160th as far as skill and experience. Right. The, you're the top of the top. You're the top of the pyramid, which is really badass and cool. So walk yeah. the viewers and the listeners through what happens when you get shot down. How'd you find yourself in the position? And what do you do once essentially, for lack of a better term, all hell is now broken loose? Well, you know, you think of being shot down as like, in you know, in the movies. Uh, first of all, if it were a missile, you know, my missile engagements were, were over before I knew it. So, you know, in the movies, it'll be, you know, uh, oh, the pilot says, oh, missile two o'clock, I'm evading, you know, cutting my heat signature, you know, whatever. You'd be dead before that, you know. So what happens is the flares, the countermeasures go off on their own. They have sensors that detect missile launches. And the flares go out. And then sometimes they go off when they're not supposed to, you know, they have a false uh, launch. And so your initial thought is, unless you saw something was, Oh, did we have an inadvertent flare launch? And the crew chief will say, yeah, I don't see anything or, Oh, missile just went by. And that's how fast an engagement happens. The, the flares go out and then you realize that the missile just went by and missed you. It, you know, diverted because of the flares. So, you know, we went seven months, you know, without getting hit, not a single aircraft had been hit in seven months out of the four. And then we had seven actually, by the time this happened and, you know, I talked about getting shot at every night, you know, 23 millimeters, big, big bullets. It's bigger than a 50 cal. And, you know, they usually have two or four barrel guns that shoot those things. So it's, you see it in the, in the news clips, you know, like Iraq, you know, where the, it's the bullets are snaking across the sky. You know, that stuff's getting shot at us every night. RPGs, you know, you see them go by. Um, and then the surface air missiles, we know of at least 16 that were fired at us. And then a couple of maybes that could have been something else, but we don't know for sure. And um, so we're kind of feeling impervious to enemy fire, you know, uh, like they can't hit us. And so uh, when, I, when I got hit on the top of Tarkagar, which is during Operation Anaconda, it was kind of a surprise. The, the rules of engagement had just changed the day before because there was a... Um, uh, and a friendly fire incident we call fratricide where an AC-130 destroyed uh, the lead vehicle of the main effort of the fight for Anaconda. And in that vehicle was a U.S. soldier, a guy named Harriman, a warrant officer. He was leading the main force uh, in Anaconda. And he got killed. They changed all the rules. They're like, all right, you can't shoot first anymore. Now you have to be shot at before you can return fire to make sure that, you know, there's too many, there's too much confusion. You know, no one knows who's who. I mean, this thing's big and it's one of the very first operations like this. So you, once again, you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt that, Hey, this is sort of in the beginning when 
all the tools that we now have for situational awareness just didn't exist. So I'm up on the mountain. Uh, a guy pops up from our left side about nine o'clock. Uh, and the gunner sees him, says, sir, I got a guy out here, left side, standing there. And then he disappears. I said, is he what? Is he armed? He's like, I didn't see anything, but, uh, you know, I don't know. And I said, all right, well, if he pops up again, kill him. Because in my mind at this stage, if he hasn't stayed hidden, knowing who we are, then he is a bad guy ready to engage us. So this is hostile. In my opinion, that's hostile intent. I'm not going to wait for the hostile act. Unfortunately, the guy pops up at about an 11 o'clock position and the gunner's still looking over at, you know, nine and uh, lets an RPG fly. And he hits the aircraft just behind my seat and in front of the fuel tanks. So if he'd shot, you know, a foot and a half to the right, he'd have hit the main fuel tank on the left side. And if he shot a foot and a half to the left, he'd have hit me personally. So he couldn't have hit a better spot in that respect because the aircraft didn't blow up and I didn't die. Um, but what it did do is the way RPGs work is there's like a molten jet of, I think, copper that you, you hit the thing and it shoots through in like a stream, like a, like two inch, two inch wide stream. And as it comes through, it expands in the open space, like the crew compartment and that overpressure kills everybody. And then it goes out the other side. And in this case, there's no overpressure because the doors are all open. It's just sheet metal. It's not a tank and it comes through, it blows up inside and it doesn't kill anybody. It, uh, you know, a couple of guys get some injuries and they get kind of rattled a little bit and um, it knocks out three different generators and it put damage to three different uh, high, flight high, hydraulic systems. And there, these things are all widely separated for redundancy and yet you know they all got hit so with that being said uh the aircraft is still running the cockpit goes dark so there's no no gauges no tv screens and it's very quiet because there's no cooling fans you know like a, your computer has a cooling fan you right, hear it sometimes yeah. you always hear those in the aircraft and then it's just sort of <laughs> but the aircraft's still running and um so the crew chief in the back says, fire in the cockpit, fire in the cockpit, go, go, go. So we took off. And as we took off, uh, we, we took uh, machine gun fire from what's called the Dishka. It's a 14.5 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft machine gun. And it starts ripping holes through the aircraft. And uh, during that process, Navy SEAL uh, you know, Roberts falls out about 12 feet under the ground, which was snow covered about knee to hip deep snow and uh, at this stage of the game I, I don't have any instrumentation to tell me that the rotor speed is okay right so the spinning of the rotor is what keeps you in the air right it's called a rotary wing as opposed to flying an airplane into the wind the blades do it for you and so I could hear them slow down you know I'm used to the noise I can tell that it's slower but the aircraft is still running you know the, the engines can stay on without electricity so we dive down the mountain with the intention to build up airspeed and auto rotate or crash at the bottom of the mountain using stored up kinetic energy in the rotors right it's a big long explanation but the idea is build up some speed get the rotor rpm back and crash at the base of the mountain in a controlled crash and hopefully we survive well in the meantime so roberts goes out the crew chief in the back who has a tether on grabs him and, you know, unlike Sylvester Stallone in some movie, he doesn't, you know, hang on to him and he's like, all right, I got you. He, he just pulled out with him. And uh, of course, Neil falls to the, to the snowy top below. Uh, the crew chief is hanging from this, you know, canvas tether and I'm diving down the mountain at about 120 miles an hour and only about 10, 15 feet off the trees. So he's dangling <laughs> probably inches from the trees and I don't know it. And the two crew chiefs up front finally regain their communications. And they say, Hey, we lost a guy on the LZ. And I didn't believe them. They're like, no, no, we saw him go out. And in the meantime, the other crew chief in the back is like, you know, hand over hand, pulling the other guy in from his harness. And about that time, they, they know what I'm doing now. And they go, the engines are running. Both of them are running. You don't have to go to the bottom of the hill. I was like, Okay. You know, so we level off 
and kind of turn back around and um, I look out out the windows and I can see the entire battle unfolding below me, the whole Anaconda battle. I can see the terrain features. I mean, it's, it's just easy to, to see. And now I realize we've got this guy in the landing zone, Neil. And so I said, all right, we're going to go back and get him. And about that time, the controls locked up. The hydraulic fluid had leaked out of all three systems. And you can't move the controls at all. So uh, I kind of, you know, I told everybody, hey, I can't move the controls. My co-pilot tried. I think we may have bent the controls trying to move them together. Uh, but, you know, it's not going to move without hydraulics. And I just said, hey, guys, I'm, I'm sorry. We're done. You know, there's nothing I can do now. And about that time, the controls came back. Like, all of a sudden, you know, woo! It's like, you know, when you steer wheel in your car, when you unlock it, all of a sudden, whoa. And I was like, hey, I have the controls. They said, all right, we're, go we're going back. So we banked back again toward the landing zone. And my crew chief that had pulled the other guy in is returning fire from one of the machine guns. Now, we have three machine guns on board, two mini guns, which are electric Gatling guns. Uh, back then they were powered by AC power. So with the generators out, they didn't work. They were just sitting there and they normally shoot 4,000 rounds a minute. So he's on the old M60 machine gun in the back, returning fire to the dishka that's shooting at us. And I'm headed inbound. And about that, about 50 seconds later, the controls locked up again. And what was happening was the crew chief that was returning fire on the machine gun had these little you know, like uh, oil cans, if you will, it's hydraulic fluid. And he had a, a can opener and he'd open it up and he'd, he'd pour the fluid into this little thing and he'd, he'd pump it. He had this little tiny handle. It was like this big. And he'd, like, and he'd get the fluid in there. And as soon as he did, I'd have about 50 seconds worth of aircraft control. And then it would, it would go. All the, all the holes were on the return side. So every time I moved the controls, it squirted out uh, fluid. And uh, I believe he had three cans. And uh, I realized at this point, there's no way we're going to land on the objective and get off off the, the mountain. So I kind of banked left, headed for the main battle where I knew there was some friendly forces and started a descent, hoping to land there. Uh, while we're doing that, we get toward the bottom. I realized we're not going to make it to a friendly location. We're going to shoot long uh, just based on the angle that we're flying. And we get one last can of, of fluid. And we come down to about, I don't know, 30 feet off the ground. And I've picked a spot and the aircraft starts to drift to the right. And I can't stop it. I can't move the controls to oppose that. So there's a saying in aviation, never quit flying the aircraft. So I didn't give up. Instead, I, I pushed on the foot pedals and the nose swung around in the direction of the drift. And at least we hit the mountain um, in the right direction, like nose first, as opposed to if we hit it sideways, we'd have rolled over, blew up, and that would have been that. And, and so when you hit the mountain that way, how close are you to where the enemy forces are compared to where the good guys are? I mean, what is the next plan here? Because I assume yeah. chaos is upon you at this point. So once yeah. the helicopters crash uh, with the way you kind of controlled it and brought it down, what happens next? Well, the first thing I thought of once we were on the ground was <laughs> an expletive, oh, <laughs> we're alive. Uh, we shut down the aircraft, got out. We still had the SEALs on board, minus one in my crew. We set up a perimeter. We had uh, John Chapman was the aircraft controller from the 24th STS. And he contacted an AC-130 above us. They started you know, surveying the area with their sensors. And we started planning to how we're going to get back to the top of Tarkagar. And the SEALs initially thought we were at the base of the hill, but we're really about seven miles away uh, based on the, on the flight distance. So it was about three minutes worth of flying max. And uh, so here we were on the valley floor, but we were actually north of the friendly positions and there were enemy positions all around as well. We were not under fire at this point, which is good, but we were, you know, kind of ready for that. And uh, especially with the AC-130 overhead. And eventually my wingman, so we had a, a plan that we would separate and fill our, our separate forces and then link up at an aerial rejoin point, wait 15 minutes. If someone didn't show up, 
you know, uh, uh, you start a radio search and if you don't find them, you got to go home because you don't have the gas to hang around, you know, we'll deal with them later. And sure enough, my wingman's waiting for me. 15 minutes is up. He's looking for me on the radio. The AC-130 hears him and says, hey, Razor 03 is shot down over here. So Razor 04 comes around, picks us up. So that's about 45 minutes on the ground. And uh, the, the original plan was my crew would stay on the ground. The SEALs would take my wingman back to the top of the mountain, rescue Neil, and then come back and get us. And the commander uh, back in the rear said, no, you're not leaving an air crew sitting in the middle of a battle. <laughs> Move them to Gardez, which is you know a five-minute flight away, and then go up. So that's what they did. The wingman comes in, lands, and uh, so you're about to say something. Well, let's see. Is, is this where, correct me if I'm wrong, did Chapman win the Medal of Honor? He did. In the, okay, that's because I, I always get confused who won it in this situation. Or so there were, it. were two. Two, right. two of them given. One to the SEAL team leader and one to uh, the combat controller. And and how much of – did you witness – and this is what I wanted to get to. Yeah. Did you – how close were you when the firefight, when they're trying to get to Roberts, unfolds? I was uh, eight miles away at okay. – Ford operating base Gardez watching gotcha. it on uh, uh, ISR. So I'd watch it on the Predator, but I wasn't there. There were no U.S. forces above that could watch it. It was all uh, drone footage. Gotcha. Yeah. So, uh, well, that is one of the that might be the craziest story we've ever heard on American Joyride. First shot, first shoot down story. Was there any point when you got shot down and you were going down where you thought, "This is it." I'm not living to see tomorrow. Like I'm going to die yeah. right here, right well, now. It, each time I couldn't control the aircraft, I thought we were dead. And, and uh, especially at the end when the, the last bit of fluid was used and the aircraft was sliding to the right, all I could think of is, well, we came close and I just didn't give up, you know, which most pilots won't, you know, they'll just keep flying the damn thing till they don't exist anymore. That's absolutely incredible. I can't imagine being in a situation like that where a guy's pumping hydraulic fluid via yeah. cans and you got 50 seconds, less than one minute. He's a stud. I mean, and we didn't know that at the time. That was like an after the fact, kind of like, all right, right well, let's right. see. We were flying for about three and a half minutes. And, you know, so it's about 50 seconds per can. Uh -huh. yeah. I want to get into uh, in Razor 3, your book, you talk about when you're in Iraq, there's a hostage rescue mission that unfolds. For about 20, 24, were they Iraqi being rescued? They were. They were Iraqis, yeah. And this part of your book really stood out to me because you talk about, and I'm going to let, let you say it because you'll explain it, but the, the way these hostages had been treated. So could you yeah. explain what year this is in the war in Iraq so the audience gets an idea of how hot things are? And then two, why was this scene so disturbing to you? Well, uh, time-wise, without looking at my notes, I think it's 2006, 2007 time frame, um, because I didn't get to Afghan Iraq until then. I was always more of an Afghanistan guy. Uh, we get there, and it might have been closer to 07, but I, my ground force at the time is the Rangers, and we're doing what's called um, an offset infill. We're going after uh, one of the big things we were doing is you may remember at the time in the news, there was all these vehicle borne uh, improvised explosive devices, VBIDs, right? And they were yeah. in the news every night. And I remember General McChrystal saying to us, guys, this tactical problem is now strategic level. We have to stop it from getting on the news. In other words, we've got to eliminate that threat. So we're hitting everything we can to, to get the, the bomb makers and such. Also at the time, there's a guy you may remember named Zarkari. Right? Zarkari, yes, yes. Right. He was the head of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, now ISIS. And he was cutting off people's heads. Yes. And, and putting videos on it. So he was, even Al-Qaeda, the main element, said, hey, look, you're you're too violent even for us. You know, and he's like, oh, well, screw you then. I'll do it on my own. So the hunt was on for him, right? And that that was a big deal to get him. Um, so what we're doing in this case um, I'm flying with the Rangers out of uh, Balad Air Base, north of Baghdad, and we're doing offset infills. So the idea is, is you put the ground force in early in the cycle of darkness, 
you know, six to 10 kilometers away, depending on how fast they can walk based on the terrain, the distance and stuff. And even at that distance, depending on the wind, the enemy might hear you, right? But the thing is this, the guy in this one house, this bad guy that you're going after the target is not the only bad guy in the neighborhood, if you will, right? So they hear a helicopter. You, all, you can watch it on, <laughs> you can watch it on the, the Pred feeds or the ISR, uh, all these different targets, if you will, uh, come active, you know, as the guards get alert and the guards are like, you know, they got their guns pointed down, you know, outward to protect, but nobody comes because the ground force is taking their time and they're just strolling in from, you know, six, seven, eight kilometers away. And you can watch the, the enemy let their guard down, you know, cause they, it's, it might not be them. Right. right. And uh, so they, uh, they go, you know, sling arms and then they set down the arms and then they lay down and they go to sleep, especially in the summer, they'll sleep on the roof, they'll sleep on the ground and uh, we'll go, the ground force will get there. They'll, they'll cordon the uh, objective they'll get around it. So if anybody squirts off and it's a quiet thing, sometimes they'll do what they call a call out. You know, they get a loudspeaker and it's like, you know, what? Hey, come out. We're surrounded. You're surrounded. <laughs> And sometimes they come out and sometimes they fight, right? Or sometimes they breach or they climb up on the roof. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to the target to go down, but that's what this particular night was. And once you, the target is secure, you, you start what they call sensitive site exploitation or SSE. And that's to look for, you know, computers, documents, uh, names, interrogations, right? Tactical interrogation uh, or tactical questioning as they call it now to be a little more kind, um, and what happened was one of the, the bad guys like, hey, hey, I'll tell you whatever you want to know. Uh, just you know, don't hurt me. Uh, as a matter of fact, I know about a torture chamber down the road, right? And oftentimes that kind of intel will drive us to a, what we call a follow on target and we'll, we'll regroup and we'll just go do it. Well, in this case, it sounded a little more elaborate especially with the, the number of hostages and some of them were supposed to get their heads cut off. Apparently that like that next night. So are these are are these hostages held by Zarqawi's people? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, not perfect. Yeah. That's not a good thing. I'm saying well, right. No, but it sets up it sets up what's going on here. So they're they're Iraqis that were helping us, you know, or they were police officers or something like that. So he's trying to intimidate, you know, the the rest of the uh, the Iraqi population by doing this, and um, so we go back the next night with the intention of taking down, you know, the hostage rescue. And instead of an offset info, now we're flying to the X. So I'm going to put the aircraft right next to the target building and we're going to land in whatever pattern that the, the ground force would like us to do to make their assault easier. So we come flying in there and, you know, the ISR is overhead looking at it and like, all right, you got a couple of people on the roof, you know, guard roving on the, you know, the West side or whatever. And we come in there and, and now keep in mind, it's very dusty. And when you get next to a Chinook in the dust, it, it hurts. You know, the, the, the sand pelts you, you're getting sandblasted. And if you're not wearing goggles, uh, you can't see, right? So if you're just some average guard out there at night and it's pitch black and all of a sudden a Chinook comes whipping in and lands next to you, you're not standing there going, I'm going to shoot him. You, you kind of you cover over like this. So we did that. And I basically dragged my landing gear across the top of the like the tv antennas and such and uh, landed right next to the building about the rotor blades are about 30 feet long on a chinook and i landed about 33 35 feet from the building so it was really close and that you know the ramp comes down the rangers come out they took the place they flew you know they they flow through the building over the top whatever they got to do and i can't remember the number off the top of my head without looking at my notes but it's like 20 something people that had been tortured. And this was stuff that actually made Fox news about a week later. Uh, I still have the, like a, the online uh, version of the, you know, print print screens of, uh, of some of the things that uh, like, they didn't show the actual things they showed like the how to manual, which was sort of like a cartoony, almost like a comic book. And they showed you how to drill into a guy's kneecaps or, you know, hang them from a door and a meat hook or, you know, how to cut off a head or something like that. And, uh, you know, we came out of there, all the bad guys fought, nobody came off alive uh, except the hostages. 
And we landed back in a place called Ramadi and we let them out and I, you know, the aircraft is still running. The ground force comes off. They escort, you know, the, uh, the rescued hostages uh, to a safe area to be uh, debriefed. And I was watching these Iraqis just hug these guys, which just, you know, up until then I'd never really seen somebody so grateful to see Americans, you know, and it really felt good. You know, uh, of all the things I did, um, Rescues and Kazavaks have to rate up there as the most, uh, you know, self-satisfying. You know, when you go save somebody, whether it's because someone's going to kill them or because they've been injured and you got to get them to life-saving, uh, you know, facilities, that really feels good. The way you describe it in Razor 3, if you, if you haven't read the book and you're watching this, you got to get this book. you got to read it. It's incredible. Did that change your calculus a little bit? Because in Afghanistan, you're fighting the Taliban, you know, but now we're talking about like the most sadistic, evil shit that you could possibly imagine. And did you start yes. looking at the enemy a little differently once you had seen with your own eyes what they were doing to people? Uh, I don't think so, because I still maintained that that feeling of 9-11, you know, so I always had that in Afghanistan. And if somebody was going to stand up against us, then I'm going to do my best to kill them. And uh, you want to be friendly? Well, be friendly back. But you know, if you're going to fight, then we're going to kill you. And uh, you know, there are some things like Zarkari that are just that much more brutal and above and beyond. And it feels that much more satisfying when you get them. You know, we finally got him on a bombing. You know, we uh, dropped a precision bomb on him. And uh, yeah. Oh, oh man. It, it, like I said, guys, you got to get Razor 3. You got to read this book because we're just really scratching the surface of some of the stories that are in that thing. I do want to get to a few other things here uh, as we kind of near uh, the, the end. Number one, you've worked with the most elite uh, direct action elements in the world. You've worked. Oh, oh, hold on a sec. Can we pause a sec? Yeah, sure. Let me. I got uh, it. Recording is back on. All right. They'll clean that up in editing, so don't worry about okay. it. Let me pull my... Um, okay. So you've worked with some of the most, all of the most elite direct action elements in the in the world. You've got Delta, yeah. you've got SEAL Team 6, you have the Army Rangers. In your opinion, as an unbiased helicopter pilot, which unit in your mind, Alan Mack, when it comes to the direct action, whether it's uh, hostage rescue, taking out bad guys... Which one of those units to you is most impressive? Oh, they're all equally impressive. They're oh, just like come my kids. On. No, <laughs> come no, no, on. no, 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 I can't do it. I can't do it. Uh, I will tell you this. They all have their, their niche. You know, um, if you want a good, no kidding airfield takedown, you want the Rangers uh, and they can do other things, but that's really their specialty when it comes to, CAG and DevGrew, it depends on the squadron and the troop that you're dealing with, right? So, so I can't generalize, you know, Delta is better than SEAL Team 6 or the other way around. I can tell you that each, each, uh, each troop, each squadron is a little bit different. And as people change over, you know, some are more aggressive than others. Some are a little less risk averse, but they all, you know, they're the best assault force in the world. I love flying them, you know. I think I think all those tier one guys and you and I were talking briefly before uh, we started recording. To me, it's just so cool. They're just so cool to be doing that stuff. It's crazy. I do want to ask you about the night vision thing, because yep. you've flown a ton under night vision. Describe quickly for the audience how much of a game changer is it when you're flying and you don't need night vision, and then when you're flying and now you got nods on and things of that nature. How different are those two things? Oh, night vision goggles are amazing. I, I'll start out with saying that um, my when I did Desert Storm, you know, I was a young W1, a brand new, right? I was a brand new co-pilot. And out of 16 air crews, there were only six of us that were current and qualified in goggles and could fly missions, right? Out of 16. Because the other guys were all, you know, older. They didn't want to do it. Goggles were considered dangerous at the time. And six we we did a mission in the daytime is norman schwarzkopf big left hook right up in to objective cobra that was done during the day because it was deemed too dangerous at night and i could tell you right now 
we none of us would have walked out of that thing alive if we'd done it at night, you know, because it was tough. And the goggle technology at the time wasn't really that good. So people would rather fly at night unaided with like no goggles. And we actually lost an aircraft to an unlit antenna because they didn't wear goggles because they thought it was safer than wearing goggles. And the air crews that wore goggles didn't hit it because, you know, they were in goggles. So then, you know, as time goes by in the technology, I ended up teaching at Fort Rucker, Alabama, teaching how to fly Chinooks. And one of the things was I had to teach night vision goggles. So I had a guy, he was a Vietnam vet. He was still in the National Guard and he had to do goggles and he was scared. You know, he told me, he says, Al, I'm scared of flying goggles. Everyone tells me how horrible it is. And I was like, dude, come on, come out with me. It's going to be fine, right? So we go out and we come back and he's like, you, we, if only we had these in Vietnam, we'd have kicked some ass. You know, this is great. He goes, I don't know why people are scared. And I'm like, well, I mean, this is a nice night. You know, this is like a high loom night. You know, there's no rain. It's not nasty. And we're not doing anything but flying traffic patterns. So, I mean, there's, it, it does get challenging. You got to have experience to, to do it okay. And, you know, as time went by, you know, the Army just got better and better at it. And the Night Stalkers, I mean, we're Night Stalkers, right? We fly at night, barely any at daytime. So I have thousands of hours under night vision goggle. And they're like, you know, I think the, the visual acuity when I left, they were 20. 35 something like that so not 2020 so you had some things that over time you learned called uh monocular cues and visual cues and you can tell things you don't have any real depth perception but you can tell by the size of objects or you know uh where they are in the field of view you know how big they are how far away they are and now you know i'm, I'm not even sure I, I know there's some serious improvements that have happened since then and you know when i was doing these combat missions the enemy didn't have them for the most part you know they every once in a while we'd recover a a set of of goggles on an objective but it was rare you know now i mean you can buy them at cabela's bass pro i mean they're buy them on amazon you can get the uh you can get the ones with the four with the four um i don't know the four tubes yeah they're 50 they're fifty thousand dollars though if you want to buy them commercially all right last question here for you this has been an awesome interview alan you've told some incredible stories and i hope everyone like i said razor threes his book when you hear people that want to be a Monday morning quarterback when it comes to what you saw in the military what you did in the military maybe you turn on the tv and you hear mm-hmm. some guy opining about, well, here's what we should have done, or here's why we shouldn't have done X, Y, and Z. They've mm-hmm. never been near a battlefield. What do you feel when you hear people just say things that are blatantly ignorant, false about Afghanistan or anything else you saw? Does that upset you? Do you just let it roll off your shoulder? How's that work? Generally, it does not upset me. It, I suppose it depends on how vociferous somebody is, you know, and you know they've never been you know, if you know that person hasn't got a clue, I might look at it and go, you know, shake my head. And it's like, why is that guy even yapping? You know, he's flapping his gums. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And then I just let it go. You know, uh, when I got shot down, there was all over the main news channels. It was like, oh, the U.S. military has got Chinooks out there fighting the enemy, the big, slow, lumbering aircraft, you know, so vulnerable. And we invited all the mainstream media outlets in, gave them a briefing and a flight. And I told the pilot flying it. I was like the escort. I rode in the back with the reporters. And uh, I said, all right, give him a ride. You know, and we're going to take him out to range 29, which is our range. And we're going to set him on the ground. And then you're going to fly at us from a couple of different directions. Just let them see if they think they can hit you with anything. So he goes out there and I, I tell you, he scared the crap out of me. You know, and I just smiled the whole time. Like, hey, this is great. You know, I was like, oh, I'm going to kill him. You know, but we get out there and uh, he drops us off and then he starts you know, he gets a big loop and he comes back around. He kind of sneaks up on it. You could hear him, but you can't see him. You know, all of a sudden, boom, there he is. And one time he comes at us, he must've been doing 160 and right at us, you know, we're like on an elevated platform. He's coming right. It looks like he's going to hit us. And all the reporters hit the deck. They're all in the prone position. I'm still standing with my hands on my hip, you know, like what's going on guys. I mean, I didn't think they would do that. And uh, I go, okay, well, let's use this as an opportunity to say, do you think that maybe that's not as vulnerable as you might have thought. And they're like, never heard about it in the news again till extortion one seven. And that was a whole different 
situation. Right. And that's the shoot but, down that killed a bunch of Navy SEALs, as right. the viewers have heard about before. Well, Alan, I want to thank you on behalf of OutKick and American Joyride for sitting down and giving us a really awesome tour. And for the readers, or sorry, for the viewers, remember, you can find Alan's book, Razor 3, anywhere that they sell books. And Alan, anytime you want to come back on American Joyride and share some more stories, you are always welcome. Oh, that's awesome. I had a good time. Thank you. Thank you.